Hello, good afternoon. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for this webinar today. Let me, someone give me a thumbs up if you can hear me, just make sure I've got my mic check going. All right, there you are, Jess. Thank you so much. Uh, it is June 4th. Holy cow, already June. Um, <laughs> this is the sixth one of these we've done this year, so I guess that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for joining us for this uh, direct, uh, this uh, webinar series from SACE Pro. I'm Parag Matawar, the Director of Professional Programs here and your host. Uh, I've share a little bit about SACE Pro in case you haven't been to one of these before. We are a nonprofit organization that is uh, aiming to solve the Asian leadership gap. Asians are 50% less likely to be promoted to middle management uh, than our Caucasian peers, than our white peers. Uh, and our research with nearly 100 Asian executives indicates that there are these four reasons that are pr the primary challenges. Uh, lack of political and organizational savvy, a cultural deference to authority, ineffective communication, influencing skills, and an aversion to risk-taking. But beyond that is we've got three distinct challenges. One is just even understanding of the Asian leadership gap to begin with. Many of us don't realize that it exists or don't have the numbers behind it. Um, and, uh, you know, community at large as well often struggles with this notion that Asians actually are not doing quite as well as they thought we are. Um, number two is the what to do about it. And that's where we really focus a lot here at, at SACE Pro is how do we train leadership skills with the cultural context such that those, uh, uh, so that the programming lands and actually makes an impact. And then third, let's face it, Asian ERGs and Asian development is not the top of the priority list for many companies. So we aim to pull together you know, well over 100 Asian ERGs uh, to create programs to benefit everybody, including this webinar series. This webinar series is an ongoing free series that happens monthly. Uh, it features conversations with our training partners, happens you know, every, once every four months or so. You can figure, you can follow us on the website or on LinkedIn to find the next one. They are normally sponsored, but we are unsponsored currently. So any of you who may be thinking about, hey, how can I get our company's brand name out there? Here's an excellent opportunity. Sponsor our webinar series for a good cause, and you also get a ton of press, a ton of visibility. But with that, that's not what you're here for. Uh, the overall logistics, Q&A uh, is going to be moderated by me. Uh, I'll have my own questions for our presenter, but I'm going to watch the chat. So please enter your questions in the chat and we will get to them as much as we can. Uh, the first 20 minutes or so will be with our presenter, Dr. Eugene K. Choi, who uh, I met through uh, one of our training partners, Rebecca Okamoto. Uh, we had a great conversation. He is a a uh, pharmacist who has learned a ton about how to make great decisions and being a scientist like many of us, most of us, you know, we also are just like, you know, well, what's really the science behind it? So I'm super excited about this. All of you have already made a very scientifically valid decision to join us today, of course. Uh, but with that, let me stop sharing and turn it over to Dr. Choi. Welcome. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to hit share. All right, I am super grateful to be here uh, with all of you today and very excited as well. And I'm gonna go straight into it. I'm gonna start off with a story. I'm gonna share a photo here. This is Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. That's a statue of Christ the Redeemer. It's considered one of the seven wonders of the world. I had the opportunity to spend the month in Brazil. I got to hike up there, see the sites. It was an amazing experience. The uh, sites were amazing. The food was really amazing. And I loved particularly the culture there. It's a very warm, loving, familial type culture. And I got to spend the month there doing some volunteer work. So this wasn't my view. This was my view. Uh, it's called the favelas. It's the slums that are on the mountainsides of the country. And one of the things notable about Rio de Janeiro, it's considered one of the most violent cities in the whole world. So uh, more than 70% of the kids that live in these favelas don't live past 21 years old due to all the gun violence. And they get involved with drug trafficking because that's really the only options they feel like they have to make money. So one of the things that happens here is that you would see is like you would see 
cute kids flying kites. And when they turn around, there's two pistols holstered into the back of their pants. So this is how much gun violence is going on there. And one of the things that happens often is the Brazilian SWAT team will come in and raid the favelas on occasion. So this happened three times while I was there in the slums. And one of those days, you hear somebody screaming from the distance, Kavarang, which basically translates to Brazilian slang for skull and crossbones, which basically they're saying death is coming. So that's when you hear these tanks, these big black Brazilian SWAT team tanks come in. And then that's when the gunshots start happening. Boom, boom, boom. It's ricocheting off the wall. We're all taking cover. And when it quieted down, I stepped out from the building I was in teaching music at. And then right as I step outside to see if everything's over, out from the corner pops one of the traffickers and points a gun straight at my chest. And I remember my heart jumping up into my throat. And I can still remember the fear, the terror inside my body like it was yesterday. And you see, one of the things is that we operate from this feeling for a majority of our adult lives. And I'm going to be explaining the science behind why. So like Parag mentioned earlier, introduced me, I was a pharmacist. And this is me and my new pharmacy job after working a few years. And I was developing my uh, professional career. Um, but the thing is, behind the smile was still a lot of depression, anxiety, and stress, if I'm honest. And this got me thinking, how do I take my skill sets, my professional skill sets, and take it further? I want to keep growing. I want to keep learning. And that's when I came across neuroscience. And being a scientist myself, I realized I can read a lot of these research articles and interpret it and understand it. And this is the thing I realized. Our brains are actually the most powerful piece of technology that we all have access to. But what's the problem? There's no manual that comes with it. It's not like you're born out of the womb with a manual on how to use it to the best of your ability. I mean, I would have loved that being a father of three kids. Congratulations, Mr. Choi, <laughs> new baby girl. And here's her manual on how to help her talents come out and her strengths come out and help her be at her best. But we don't. So this is where I went deep down the rabbit hole to study all of this. So how do we make better decisions? How do we do this? Think about this. How many decisions do we make in a day? It's been estimated that we make about 30 to 35,000 decisions in a day. But how do you know that those decisions are the ones that are the best for you? And this is where I want to go into. So I realized there's a process here, okay? It's a three-step, three-phase process, if so to speak, where step one is you want to develop awareness. There's a lot of things where we just don't know what we don't know. And that's often what's preventing us from making better decisions. Then there's training. This is where modern day science comes in. When you learn a little bit more science about how the brain works, it's going to teach you how to develop these skill sets to emphasize and improve your critical thinking skills and your decision-making skills. And lastly, it's implementation. If you don't implement the things you've learned, you don't experience the benefits of it. Simple as that. So one of the things that happens for a lot of us, like we said, we just don't know what we don't know. We experience these blind spots and there's avoidable mistakes that occur. So what do we need to become aware of as that first phase? So one of the first things we need to be aware of is that your brain operates in one of two states at any given time. It's what I call a survival state or an executive state. So the thing to know about a survival state, it's, it's a state where your brain gets into when you feel threatened in some way, especially if your life is in physical danger. So the key thing to understand about the state is it's a, a mode where you are reacting without thinking. You can't think. That's how you're supposed to make good decisions when you can't think. And they're not conscious decisions. So the executive state is where a lot of your brain's higher functions come on. Amazing capabilities, uh, critical thinking, executive function, empathy, intuition, innovation. Those are just a few of the many things this part of your brain is capable of. But what's the thing to understand about this is that you can only be in one or the other. You can't be in both states at the same time. So what's the shocking part? Research shows we're in a survival state for about 70% of our adult lives. Why is this? It's not because every day your life is in physical danger. It's because of something called emotional survival. You see, we experience a lot of stress on a daily basis. And research shows that emotional pain can be just as painful as physical pain based on the way the brain processes. So you have to think about this. How often are you feeling stressed, anxious, frustrated, annoyed, angry? And all of this discomfort tricks your brain into thinking that you're actually in a life-threatening scenario. And we're not accessing those critical thinking centers. We're not accessing our creativity, our empathy because of it. And we're not clear on our thinking. And we're not able to fully utilize our intellect. So because your brain's literally thinking that it's about to die when we're stressed and our environments often don't help, does it, right? With all of the media or whether the pressure we faced growing up with all the unique experiences we have growing up, it, it tends to trigger this survival state. So what's the thing to be aware of? 
your brain, when it's in a survival state, remember you're reacting without thinking and it prevents you from making good decisions. It only reactively knows how to do three, these three things. That's all your brain is programmed to know how to do when in survival. It's called fight, flight, or freeze. So if your life is in actual danger, it's very obvious. You're gonna pick up a weapon to fight and defend yourself. You're gonna run for your life in flight, or you're gonna play dead and freeze. Possums are famous for doing this because their predators like their food alive. So now what did you think I did reactively when that gun was pointed at my chest in Brazil? I froze. I froze. I didn't know what to do. And as soon as that drug trafficker realized I wasn't the Brazilian SWAT team and he moved on, I went into flight mode and I ran back into the building to take cover. So there's a deep level, deeper level of awareness here though. That's when your physical life's in danger. But what does it look like when we're in emotional survival, when we're experiencing discomfort and we're surviving from it? What does the fight response look like? It looks like when we're getting defensive. Someone said something and you're getting triggered and you got defensive. Your brain literally views that person as a threat now and you're in a fight mode. You're literally trying to attack that person. And we all know how arguments end, especially when it's with loved ones. Someone gets hurt. Or road rage is another example. It usually happens because the ego got hurt, because you got cut off, and then now your ego's hurt and you're trying to cut that back person back off and fight back without any consideration of the other cars that you might be putting in danger. There's actual physical fighting. That's a fight response to it. Usually occurs when we're emotionally overwhelmed and we, it's, we're having trouble processing it, so we get into an actual physical fist fight. What does a flight response look like in emotional survival? Procrastination is a classic one, right? Usually there's some sort of fear there. What if I do this now? I mess up. What if I do this now and I get judged? What if I do this now and, and I find out I'm not capable? And we avoid, we flee from the task at hand as a survival response and we procrastinate for that reason. And then there's actual physically avoiding someone. Uh, I grew up in New York City, so I used to take the subway to high school. And I remember my friend and I are heading to school. We're about to enter into a subway station. And outside the station is this Korean lady with her pamphlets trying to convince you to go to her church. And she's walking towards us and we're in a flight mode. We do not want to be addressed by her. And she sees that we're Asian. So she's coming up to us and she says to my friend, and we're both Korean as well. And this lady's Korean. And she says in Korean, 한국 분이세요, which translates to, are you Korean? And remember, when you're in a survival state, you're reacting without thinking. So my friend in a flight mode, reacting without thinking, responds, 아니요, which means no, but he just said it in Korean. <laughs> so remember, when you're in a survival state, you are reacting without thinking. This is why you make silly mistakes at times, okay? Because your brain isn't thinking. So what's a freeze mode? Freeze mode is uh, when your body freezes up, kind of like playing dead. It happens a lot when you get caught in a lie, for example, right? It's your brain going, Quick, pretend you don't exist right now so that this person stops interrogating you. And we do this a lot as kids. And honestly, we do it as adults too, don't we? We've seen it a lot of times. So now there's even more subtle fight, flight, freeze responses to become aware of. This is the part where it falls under the I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know what I didn't know type of category for a lot of people. What does a more subtle fight response look like? It's the need to be right. Why do we have a need to be right? Unless there's usually a fear of being wrong. And why is there a fear of being wrong? Maybe we got shamed at some point for being wrong or yelled at or berated. So we survive from that feeling by trying to be right all the time, even though it's impossible to know everything. People pleasing is another fight response. It usually occurs because there's some sort of not so great opinion about yourself. And we think by people pleasing, by saying yes, even though we don't want to say yes, that we might feel better about ourselves in the long run. Overworking is the same category. Perfectionism falls under the same category. The need to show off or the need to prove oneself. Why do we feel the need to prove ourselves unless there's something else going on more to the picture about our perspective about ourselves to begin with, where there's no level, there's no deeper level of self-acceptance. I remember I had a conversation with a client once, we're going over the fight, flight, freeze response, and this guy had everything you could imagine on paper. He was financially free, had a successful business, beautiful family, and he's going, I'm in my 60s now, and why am I still experiencing so much stress and anxiety? And he had this aha moment going, oh my gosh, I spent my whole life fighting. I spent my whole life fighting. And I said, for what? I was trying to prove to people that I'm better than my older brother. His older brother was an NFL football player. And he, my client was sharing with me in high school how his coach, football coach, told him to don't even bother trying. You're never going to be as good as him. So he fought for his whole life trying to accomplish more and do more, thinking it would help him feel better about himself. You see, the fight response always leads to burnout and a lack of fulfillment. This is why it's so important to be aware of it first so that we can start making decisions again, better decisions. Remember, we're making reactive decisions without thinking when we're in survival. 
So I had the second client. He brought up a very compelling argument. He was like, no, you need that fight response sometimes. And I said, well, technically, unless you're actually in physical life-threatening situ situation, it's usually not helping you in the long term. And he said, no, my second wife left me when I was hitting rock bottom because she wasn't being faithful. And the same thing happened with his first wife. And he was still ordered to pay child support over $2,500 a month. And he ran out of money. He was sharing a story with me how when his kid came up to him after that, asking for ice cream, he, had, he didn't even have the money to pay for that. So he scraped up all the coins in his house, went to those coin machines at the market and bought him ice cream. And he was so upset because he didn't even have enough money to buy one for himself. And he said, I had to keep my head down and my shoulder up and bash through brick wall after brick wall to get to where he's at today. And I felt it was a very compelling argument. And I said, look, as a thought exercise, this is not me telling you what you should have, would have, could have done, but as a thought exercise, what if, because you've developed the skills to get into an executive state more often, even if it's just for a moment, it's what gives you the ability to put your head up and your shoulders down for a moment. And what you might realize is those brick walls that you felt that you had to bash through were only three feet wide. So what do I mean by this? When your brain goes into a fight mode, it develops tunnel vision. If a tiger walks into the room, hungry and ready to eat you? Are you going to look anywhere else except where that tiger is? No, you develop tunnel vision and you miss out on all this other information. So there's this saying, work smarter, not harder. When we're in a fight mode, right? We tend to go into that tunnel vision and we work harder, not smarter. And this is what I think also happens a lot when we're not able to find those opportunities for us that we're qualified for. We just think working harder will be the only thing to do, right? Because of the tunnel vision and we're not seeing the other opportunities and solutions around us. So we need to be able to identify this so that we can work smarter, not harder. What does a flight response look like when it's more subtle? It's when we numb ourselves. There's no judgment around any of this, but because of a lot of the intense amount of stress we tend to experience every day, it's one of the survival mechanisms is by numbing ourselves. Some people do it by overeating. Some people do it by overindulging in things like alcohol, food, right, sex, drugs, to the point of addiction. Again, there's no judgment around it. It's just good to be aware of it that it's in our programming. That's one way we cope. What's the freeze response look like? <clears throat> it's when we receive shocking news, for example, where a tragedy occurs or trauma occurs, your nervous system kind of freezes up because it's overwhelmed. So when your nervous system is overwhelmed, you freeze. And it looks like not taking action. I'm, I'm sure everyone can relate to this. There's those mornings where you wake up in the morning, you're not looking forward to the day, you don't want to get out of bed, you freeze. And you know what was a big aha for me was? I realized this is why there's no such thing as laziness. What someone might label as lazy there might be a chronic freeze response going for, on for them. There's much more to the picture. There's no such thing as laziness. So this is why it's so important. What are your own fight, flight, freeze responses, right? I'm not monitoring the chat, but feel free to share any kind of awarenesses or aha moments you're having about this because this is one of the most important things to be aware of. It was such an eye-opening experience for me. And this is the first thing I always recommend for people to practice in terms of awareness to everyone I work with. If you can see a fight response, flight response, freeze response, whether it's in yourself or in others, it just kind of opens up your eyes and it helps make sense of a lot more things. See, when you're in this survival state and your life's not actually in danger, it actually isn't working towards your benefit because you can't think clearly. Remember, you're in a tunnel vision. You get this narrow focus. And one of the things that happens is you develop blind spots because of that tunnel vision. What solutions are there? What opportunities are there? What ideas are there that you might be missing out of because of this tunnel vision? And you can't make good decisions because of it. You know, they surveyed this group of low-income individuals one time, and they asked them a simple question. What is your plan to get out of this difficult financial scenario? And a lot of them responded to win the lottery, and they meant it. And it's not because they're stupid. It's not because they're incapable. It's because simply their nervous system is so stressed out based on the circumstances. Their brains literally cannot think. You see, if we're operating like this on 70% of our adult lives, that's what's happening. You can't think long-term. We're so busy, focused, hyper-focused on what we think the problem is on a short-term basis. And it feels like we're reactively putting out fires all the time. So how do we get ourselves to a place of making better decisions? This is what where the training comes in. We want to develop the skills of turning on your executive state at will. Because when you learn how to do this, you get better executive function, which is just a fancy term for making good decisions. You get clarity on what your best next steps are. You improve relationship dynamics because your empathy is getting activated again. You can't be empathetic when you're in a survival state. You become transactional. You have better energy. There's less procrastination or brain fog. So where does the training come in? You want to prioritize training yourself to regulate your nervous system well.
Remember, your brain's not helping you when it's in survival state if you're not in actual danger. You can't think clearly, and this is the sole reason for making a bad decision. And there's a lot of tools out there, which is great, and I teach about all of that, whether it's breathing, meditation, mindfulness, all of those are great resources, but I'll share one here that's I found interesting that not everyone might have heard of, and it's, it's a skill called labeling your emotions. UCLA did this study where they had a group of people come in, and the researchers would show them pictures of people's faces in survival state emotions and ask them to name the emotion. Hey, uh, what do you see here? Uh, as soon as they showed the photo, their survival state brain immediately turned on and they asked them, can you tell me what emotion you're seeing in this picture? And they said, oh, that's easy. That's anger. That's fear. As soon as they named it, guess what? Survival state brain turned off, executive state brain turned on. And this is where your emotional regulation centers come on, by the way. It's your frontal lobe. And why does this happen? It's because remember, to label something, you actually have to think about it. If you're in survival, you can't think. So simply practicing, I'm feeling blank, I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling frustrated, I'm feeling stressed, actually turns on the emotional regulation centers of your brain. And it's important to distinguish between I feel versus I am. I am is a declarative statement, like you're adopting it as your identity. I am sad, I am upset. You wanna make sure it's feel, because feeling you're acknowledging it's something that comes and goes, because feelings come and go, don't we? So uh, doesn't it? We sometimes we feel happy, sometimes we feel sad. So it's a great practice to do each day as a, as a way to train yourself as something you can do all the time. And that's one resource I'll leave you with. So how do you find, now you can understand when you get yourself out of that survival state, you, you can turn on the critical thinking centers of your brain and you can train yourself to get better at making good decisions. So one characteristics of the survival state to be aware of is you go into dualistic thinking when you're in survival. Dualistic, meaning it's usually a yes, no situation. Should I go to this party or not? Should I ask for a raise or not? Should I eat this food or not? And as you know, a lot of the uh, outrage that occurs a lot of the times in our society is because of dualistic things. It's two parties in survival. And you know, there's a lot of sensitive topics out there, but it's one or the other. And it's usually a party trying to fight the other party or avoid the other party in, in flight response. And they're not meeting in the middle ground to try to collaborate. It's because when your brain feels like its life is in danger, there's no room for gray area. Just tell me what to do. I don't want to think about this. I can't think about this. So this is why when you notice this type of thinking, you can identify you're probably already in a survival state because there's probably a lot more context that's very important to help you make a good decision. So before reacting, you want to broaden your mind to more context and add more options. It forces your brain to look at a bigger picture, get out of tunnel vision. So one exercise is something called the vanishing options thought exercise. So imagine you're like, hey, I'm gonna do, do I, can I do this or either this? You gave yourself two options. Th these are the solutions you came up with. Imagine, oh, you can't do either of these options and you force your brain to come up with more options. It, in a sense, forces your brain to get out of tunnel vision and get out of survival. Because survival is like this all or nothing one or the other, there's no other options. There's no third, fourth, fifth option. You feel very cornered and it's a brain state. So how many bad decisions are made regularly? If we make between 30 to 35,000 decisions per day, and you know what? Most of these, these uh, decisions are on autopilot. You do it without thinking. Why? Because by the time you're 35 years old, 90 to 95% of your brain operates on autopilot. It's habits. You don't walk down the stair going, I need to put my left foot out, my right foot out. You do it without thinking. The same applies to your patterns of thinking, your feelings, and your behaviors. And it's why it's often hard to change those bad habits and those bad decisions we make every day. And we all had that experience. I know X, Y, Z is really good for me, but because I don't feel like it, I don't do it. That's your programming. It's just programming. There's no judgment around it. It's not because you're evil. It's not because you're a horrible person. It's just the way you're conditioned based on your unique experience and how your brain got programmed, just like a computer can get programmed to do the same thing every day. So how do you know that you're making the best decisions for you? It's once you develop the skills of getting out of survival, you'll be able to do that. You'll have the ability to stay calm, even though things feel like it's out of control. It enables your brain's executive function to activate, and you're able to look at the full picture. You make better assessments of the situation, both from a short-term and a long-term perspective. And this empowers you to make a conscious, intentional decision rather than a reactive one that comes from stress and fear. Here are the people who have my heart. And you know what broke my heart is that if we're in survival state for 70% of our adult lives, it means I'm disconnected from them for about 70% of my adult life because our empathy centers aren't on. And it created transactional relationships. How do I know this is true? Whenever I get into an argument with my wife, I would start bringing up the stuff I've done for her, even though I claimed I do all these things for them because I love them. Why would I bring it up during an argument then? Was I truly doing it for, uh, from a place of generosity and authenticity? 
And you see, that's the thing that kind of changed the game for me. The science I discussed today is what transformed my life. It helped me become much more productive, improve my skills, and deepen my relationships. You see, what would the world look like for trained and equipped to get ourselves out of survival state more often? What amazing things can be created by us because of it? And that's the question that's been driving me to continue this conversation with whoever I can. And it's been my mission ever since. That's me. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Choi. That was spectacular. Um, the Starting with the story, you know, in the favelas in, in uh, Rio de Janeiro, oh, I know, um, uh, I remember when I traveled there 20 some years ago, just seeing the stark contrast between, you know, uh, the Cristo Redentor and then in Copacabana and, you know, whatnot. And then just on the other side, <laughs> favelas everywhere. And yes. Um, just a, a stark contrast. So is that, was that one of those pivotal moments for you when you're just like, okay, I've got to do something different or like what, were there some keynote, like some, some, some massive aha light bulb moments that said, okay, I've got to, I, I need to figure out what's going on here. You know, yeah, it was a pivotal moment for me. It was, um, it was a pivotal moment afterwards. I had such culture shock, you know, you're mm -hmm. living in, and this is not my first time doing work like that, but you know, you're living in an area like that where people are dirt poor and literal poverty. Some of these houses don't have four walls. And then you come home uh, to my, you know, I came home to my first world country and it's hard to hold a conversation with my friends while they might be having different, different kind of challenges that they might be not happy about. And I just felt like I couldn't relate. And um, that was a pitiful moment for me because it nearly helped me question, like, am I really contributing as much value as I can? Um, and it got me thinking a lot about that, which is why I went down all of these rabbit holes over the years and many rabbit holes over the years. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, you know, some of this I'd never thought about, of course, most of us probably heard about fight, flight, or, or, or freeze. I'd never really thought about it in the work context. I mean, it's absolutely true. And so I like the way you put it about a subtle, uh, it's a subtle flight yes. or subtle flight. And I'm a procrastinator <laughs> I'm, and I have justified my procrastination because what I've learned is that I do my best work under pressure. I do mm -hmm. my best work and I've realized that if I do work too early, I'm going to end up redoing it. So uh, <laughs> my justification for it, but I never thought about it from this standpoint. And now it's causing me to think, oh, well, maybe I have just somehow justified my freeze response. I think it was, or was it flight, whichever one it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm just, you just make me question all these things over a little bit. Uh, and so thank you for that. Um, of course. Uh, do you feel like any of these, you know, where do you think Asian programming, you know, cultural programming, what do you think uh, in your experience, have you seen that we have the tendency to, because there's no one size fits all, but yes. what, do you, what do you feel like are maybe some of the tendencies that our cultural upbringings may have us do a little bit more of or a little less of or whatnot relative to our peers? Yeah. So with the fight, flight, freeze response, it's different for everyone. What could be a fight for one person could be a flight for another person, by the way, right? Some people flee to work, right? By keeping themselves busy, right? Mm -hmm. To keep their mind off of things. Um, when it comes to our culture with the fight, flight, freeze response, I'll speak for myself being in Korean culture, right? In Asian uh, Korean culture, you know, there's a lot of cultural expectations and shame as well, right? Shame yeah. is used as a, as a tool and a weapon uh, in some people. Um, one, that's one of the things I struggled with was the whole people pleasing fight response. We're taught like respect your elders. Yeah. Don't question your elders. And then you hear you hear stories like this where uh, Ashiana Airlines, which is a Korean airline, there was this big, big accident way back where a couple hundred people um, died, unfortunately, in the incident. And they're listening to the black box recorder. It's literally the younger pilot beating around the bush with the older pilot going like, shouldn't we do that? And the older pilot's just like, no, it's fine. It's fine. And then obviously, right, like a horrible thing happened and they had to do a whole training culturally for the whole whole um, company. Like if you see in a, like culture goes out the door, you speak up. So I feel like there's a lot of that where it's hard for us to speak up and express ourselves with the fear of retaliation because it's an entitlement. Age is an entitlement for some people. Just because I'm older than you, I deserve your respect. And it creates this kind of fear kind of dynamic. And fear is great at controlling other people. 
which is why I think culturally it's so important to be able to identify what's a fight, flight, freeze response so that you don't feel paralyzed by someone else in their fight response trying to control you. You see what I'm saying? Right? Yeah. So to develop the eyes to just be able to see what's a fight, flight, freeze response is a great start because especially when people use anger, I think in Asian culture, there's a lot of anger being used to get people to obey. Um, one of the things I explain to people is like, look, anger is a secondary emotion. What's the primary emotion behind anger? If you go to a mommy lion with its babies, it's going to use anger to get you to back off. Meaning when someone's angry, it's because they're scared. They're feeling vulnerable about something. So I think in the workplace, when we experience people who are very upset and angry, if we can look at it from that perspective, we're able to develop more healthy boundaries and communication skills to manage those kind of situations. Because I think because we deal with it culturally a lot too, because I've dealt with it culturally, it's, it's, it is traumatizing for a lot of people, including myself, but it, it's a skill to be developed, if that makes sense. And I think it yeah. starts with understanding how all of this works, right? How the brain works, fight, flight, freeze response. It's coming from a place of fear, right? Not from a place of compassion or empathy or collaboration. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's very well put. Thank you for that. Uh, the, the one that I remember always is the perfectionism. And you mentioned this also is, um, I tell the story a lot and most Asians can nod their head, most immigrants in general, um, and not only immigrants, but many immigrants can can also, uh, you know, resonate with this of uh, of the expectation of perfection on your test scores, right? And mm. uh, not getting ice cream for getting a 95, you get questioned, what about the other five, right? Which sets in motion this idea of perfectionism of, you know, keep on working hard until you have every single thing absolutely positively correct, which works great if you're building a space shuttle. Uh, but for the majority of us who are not building a space shuttle every single day, it's a little bit of a unnecessary stress that we put on ourselves um, at the expense of effectiveness, right? And so uh, your perfectionism piece reminded me of that because that's that's usually, that's that's the one thing I think that uh, more than anything that, that, uh, that sticks out for my upbringing at least that I had to kind of unlearn, which was hard, <laughs> which is yeah. super hard. No, that's a great point because, look, perfect exists when it has to do with a skill or a competency, right? If I'm an engineer and I want you working on a million dollar, multi, multi million dollar project with me, you don't know what one plus one is. Like, sorry, your skill set is not there, right? Um, but I think what happens is it gets all jumbled in with our experiences as a human, our feelings. And then we let it tie into our self-worth. And that narrative gets placed on us a lot, like you said, in our culture. It's like, you didn't get this grade, right? Where's the other, where's the other five points? And it, it triggers a lot of these meanings that we attach to things, right? Because as kids, you attach meanings to things all the time that aren't necessarily true, right? You get bit by a dog at four years old, you think all dogs are dangerous. Right. So I think that's very important. You're right. Like, I think it's so important to be aware of so that we can separate those things, right? Your value as an individual versus like your competency or skill set that you have. Because in that world, yes, like it can be graded. Um, but yeah, like it, it triggers so much survival because of that reason, because of how things get misinterpreted in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, you know, kind of along those lines, then, you know, you shared the picture of your three beautiful kids along with your Asian wife. How is your parenting styles shifted? And is that something that the two of you are like lockstep? I shouldn't get you in trouble. Sorry. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, you're good. but like, how, how's that conversation gone? And then potentially even with your, with both of your parents as well. Yeah. I mean, it's always a work in progress. I mean, my kids are little, so, you know, anyone who has little kids understands your patients get tested very, very often. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was such a game changer for me. You know, I used to say this phrase to my daughter, um, you're making me so mad mm -hmm. when she wouldn't listen to me. And I realized it was because of my own stuff, right? Like I had a, a not so great relationship with my father. So I would think thoughts as a kid, like if I'm ever dad, I'm not going to be like him, like with anger and resentment. And if I'm angry, I'm literally disconnecting from my daughter, right? Based on the science. So that broke my heart. And the thing that really got me was like, if I keep doing this, my daughter's going to think there's such a thing as her being the cause of daddy's anger. Yeah. Right. And what happens when she turns into an adult? She has the unethical boss that overworks her because she's afraid of making the boss mad. She will say yes when she wants to say no. What if in a relationship, she's afraid of making the person mad so she won't sleep with them, right? When they're pressuring her to, or do you see what I'm saying? Like sensitive things like that got me off my back and go, hold on. No, no, no. Baby girl, you can never make anyone mad. And I explained anger to her. I said, this is my fault. And then I simply switched the phrase from you're making me mad to I'm feeling mad. And I realized this is ownership.
So when a leader comes up to me and go, my team's pissing me off right now, I invite them. I tell a story like that. And I invite them like, is there more to the picture here? Or is it really your team that's causing the emotion? Are you playing a role as well in your emotion? Because there's plenty of other parents I realize that might have kids that don't listen and their patience level is much higher than mine. So that's kind of when I realized like as a parent, yeah, like it's so important for me to model ownership over that and not to blame them for my emotions, uh, set firm, set healthy and kind boundaries. That was another thing too. I realized in a survival state, people pleasers are horrible at setting boundaries, saying yeah. yes when we want to say yes or saying no when we want to say no. And I realized that's on me because I had trouble setting boundaries. I allowed it to get to a place of anger. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Um, so anyway, like it was game changing for me. I read so many parenting psychology books over the years. My my and I share all of that stuff with my wife. Still a work in progress, especially when you have three. Uh yeah, like they're eight, six, and one right now. <laughs> <laughs> so nonstop. And they're home from school. Yeah, because school's over here in California. <laughs> Good point. Let me take a a a, a, a audience question. So Alex asks. Um, what are the scientific tools to move into our executive state faster? So step one is um, always, always just practice being aware, right? So then step two, it's where a little bit of more training comes in. There's, uh, I categorize them into two separate categories. There's the short-term work you can do, right? Deep breaths, regulate your nervous system. We hear all that all the time. Take a deep breath. Uh, labeling your emotions was another one of them. Uh, getting good at paying, bringing your awareness, uh, whether it's in yourself to someone else, is there concern here or is there curiosity here? When you're in survival, you're not curious. You're not in a state of curiosity. You're not trying to learn something new. When you're in survival, you're going to stick with your old ways. So if you ever hear that saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, it's because of survival state. You just stick with what you know and you don't move into what you don't know. So paying attention, is this person in front of me concerned or curious? Am I feeling concerned or curious? Then you can identify which state you're in. So that's a short-term work. The longer-term work is working with the programming. Like I mentioned before, we do all this on a programmatic level. By the time we're 35, 90 95% of your brain's on autopilot. It includes your thoughts, right? The 70,000 thoughts you think every day, 90 to 95% of those thoughts, same thought as the day before based on research. And guess what? A lot of these thoughts are negative thoughts about yourself. Mm -hmm. So which state does that trigger? Survival state or executive state? So um, that's one of the deeper questions to ask over time is, wait, if I'm in survival this much of the time and I'm not actually about to be murdered, what am I surviving from? That's a deeper question to ask. And that's where your perspective about yourself, your beliefs about yourself surface. So some portion, as you mentioned, you know, you get into survival state or into automatic mode uh, you know, you were talking about walking up and down the steps. It's not that you want to necessarily switch that so that you are consciously thinking about how to walk into, because that's, that's kind of overtaxing in the other way. Is there a, right. is there a percentage range that is a little bit more ideal from the research that you've done in terms of how much you should be in survival mode versus executive mode? Is the goal to be at a hundred percent executive well, yeah, mode? You, as possible, or? Yeah, I don't think you can get into a hundred percent because <laughs> we need this. The survival state is what kept us alive all these years for centuries, right. ever since the cavemen, cavewomen days, right? Like, so it's like, um, that's the thing to think about is like survival state, um, you, you only need it if you're in physical danger. So you want to decrease the percentage because um, it's not meant to be long-term. If your body thinks it's about to die, you know how taxing that is on your body? Your heart is beating rapidly, overworking. Your lungs are overbreathing. Uh, your digestive system shuts down because if your body thinks it's about to die, it's not a time to be eating food, right? Which is why a lot of people who are overly stressed have digestion issues, by the way, right? And we're mm -hmm. seeing a rise in that kind of stuff, right? Uh, with various diseases. Um, yeah, and a reproductive system shuts down. This is why a lot of people who want to have kids and they're stressed out all the time have trouble conceiving. Um, so- you want to just decrease it as much as you can because um, the idea is like just improving. If you can improve a little bit more, like you'll make better decisions. You'll operate at a better level and you'll experience it. You'll feel, and it feels a lot better, by the way. It doesn't feel like you're always under pressure and yeah, you're, you're, you just feel a lot better. Great. Thank you. I'm going to take one of the questions from the Q and a on the, uh, on the on the uh, tab here in way I see your hand up if you could type your question in to the chat or into the Q&A section. Um, so Gina Wong asks, um, this advice is really applicable for yourself or the self improvement and so forth. Is there a way to think about how to improve a team's yes. executive thinking? And what approach would you take there? 
hundred percent. So you have to think about this. If we're in survival state for about 70% of our adult lives, it's because the mind, uh, there's a term that Amy Edmondson used. She's a great organizational psychologist. Uh, she coined the term psychological safety, right? So there's a lot of reasons why we don't feel safe for many, many different reasons. So if you want to do it with a team, number one is just give them the basic training on the science. How does the brain work? How, how can you help them be able to identify fight, flight, freeze response more often? And over time, if they get better at doing that and you can cultivate a safe space, you're able to have the deeper, more, you know, like the, the deeper, more challenging conversations that are necessary for growth. So I would start there is just awareness. Start with the awareness. And then if you want to train them on the science, you train them more on the science to learn about science. Yeah. I like that you mentioned the psychological safety. We, you know, we've learned a lot about the same exact thing. Even that's why we do the training that we, the way we do is um, we've learned that uh, by having an audience that is predominantly Asian uh, heritage, it creates a psychological safety for the audience members who we have a higher percentage of shyer folks. Some portion of that is cultural upbringing, as we talked about, right? Yes. Uh, but it uh, it creates the space that people feel more comfortable asking a question, especially when others in the room also have a very similar uh, 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 cultural background or experience growing up and whatnot and can nod their head and say, yeah, me too. And it builds that community feel, uh, which then makes it a lot easier to feel vulnerable and question and, uh, and explore. So, uh, I think that makes perfect sense. Actually, it's a great parallel. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Xavier asks, um, isn't the, uh, isn't there also the other side of the same coin? I heard flight or fight response uh, or that state would also trigger and enable humans to do things uh, for the better where humans would otherwise wouldn't have been able to tap in and use. So like the example of, you know, uh, you know, people getting superhuman state, uh, yes. strength, right. Being able to lift cars or being able to very uh, Sullenberger, right. That captain who was able to, uh, you know, tap into who knows what and figure out yes. how to land that plane on, on the Hudson and whatnot. Uh, certainly <laughs> that wasn't an automatic, it was something else going on. So are there scenarios where yes. this is actually a very good thing? Yeah, I think um, what's very important for me to communicate is like, I'm not trying to paint the picture of these different states as good or bad. Um, they are both very necessary. So like you said, in a physical life-threatening scenario, you need fight, flight, freeze response. That adrenaline needs to, pump so that you can lift the car and save your baby's life. Same thing with that plane. So it's a matter of, it's a matter of having the right state at the right time. That's, that's the key here, right? If you're not in a life draining scenario and you're going into a survival state and you're overthinking, overworking, overdoing things, right? Tunnel vision. Um, you're not going to be able to access your leadership capabilities. You're not going to be able to grow because your brain can't receive information in that mode. You're not curious. You're not going to be able to access your creativity. You're disconnecting from the relationships around you with your colleagues. You enter into transactional nature, right? You don't care about people. You're just here to, you see what I'm saying? It's a very transactional type of thinking. So um, it's about time time and place, right? If, if it's an actual life-threatening situation, yes, like don't start meditating. <laughs> like turn on your survival state and save the person's life or save your life, right? Um, but that's not every day for us, right? We're not running away from saber-toothed tigers anymore every single day. So we just have different stressors that come along with the picture. Um, but that's the evolution that's happened is we're able to learn. I mean, there's something called metacognition because of our frontal lobe, right? This is our prefrontal cortex. That's where your executive state that I coined comes from. Um, it's the biggest out of any other species. It's the highest ratio. It's 40% of your brain. We have the ability to think about our thoughts like as humans. So this is why yeah. it's so important yeah, to be able to access that at the right state based on the right time. Gotcha. Way asks a question about, you know, when you speak of when you speak in a different language, maybe English or a second language, may, maybe you're translating your everyday life in, from English into your native language, which is a lot of brain consumption, a lot of brain yeah. power that has to be consumed. How does that, uh, anything you've seen about how that impacts your ability to function executively or survival based? In term, I'm trying to understand in terms, I'm trying to understand the premise of the question. How have you seen that it impacts your decision-making process? Does it slow it down? Does it speed it up? Does it, that Oh, if you have like a high clarity? cognitively demanding yeah, like kind of role? Just having that additional load. Um, 
Um, you know, yes. I've often thought about that as well as people talk about, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, what you call it. Um, dang it, I can't think of the term. But I've, you know, <laughs> there was a <laughs> Modern Family, right? The show okay. Modern Family, right? And uh, uh, the uh, the wife, the Colombian wife, talked about, you know, if you you can't, you don't even understand how smart I am in Spanish. <laughs> right? because yeah. she has to translate everything yes and, so forth. and it changes how fast she can respond and that's right. what's going on yeah uh, and so just curious whether or not that you found anything where that has an impact on decision it does yes anything so okay i think i get what where the question's coming from now yeah so anything that requires a high cognitive load like a demand from your brain um it will tire you out and if you don't give yourself enough rest at the necessary times you're going to go into a state of survival um, that's absolutely right. Um, it's funny because I'm I'm laughing because like, you know, there's times where I would be sitting the whole day in front of a computer and I would end the day and tell them I was like, oh, I'm so tired. I'm like doing what? <laughs> I'm like, I, there was a lot of cognitively demanding things I had to do, write an article, give a presentation, all that kind of stuff. Um, anything that requires a lot of your brain power, it does burn calories. It does tire you out. Um, and if you don't recharge and replenish, you're going to go into a state of survival and it's going to make things worse. You're going to get overtired overworked, over burnt out, right? Do you have any advice for people who experience a rush of energy and excitement when under significant pressure? Perhaps you've had some of these colleagues before. I know I've had some as well who just really thrive under that situation uh, and really love like being on point right at then. How can they in those scenarios or in general cultivate executive uh, executive? Uh, presence. I don't know if it's executive presence as much as it is executive thinking um, or their executive state in those types of scenarios. I mean, if if you're saying it's like an adrenaline rush uh, because of a fight response, I mean, the world rewards fighters, right? Hard workers. They pay you more money and all that great stuff. Um, but if it's something that you're saying like, hey, like we need that at times, um, I have yet to meet somebody and I've coached a lot of people now that are kind of in their elder years. I have I have yet to meet someone that hasn't burnt out. If if what they're doing in these modes is indeed a fight mode, right? Um, when you're in an executive state, you access something called flow state. Um, everyone's experienced it, where like it feels amazing. You lose track of time, and you're just really engaged in the thing you're engaged in because it's actually giving you energy versus draining your energy. If you're in that mode, then yes, you tend to become more superhuman in a sense. You become super productive. You perform, right? Like it's like one of those people you're asking, like, how did you get all this stuff stuff done so quickly? It's just like, I don't know, I just did it. Um, so there's there is that mode. But if what you're referring to is just like, hey, it's the thing, if I'm an adrenaline junkie, right? Like I like that feeling of the pressure, um, there's a good chance you'll burn out. Like physiologically speaking, your body's going to run out of juice at some point. Everyone has gotcha. a different threshold, but it will burn out at some point if you haven't experienced it already. Um, yeah, no, sorry. I'm... <laughs> You're good. I have something else going on in the background. I apologize. <laughs> um, you know, or what are there certain books or certain... Uh, books that you came across, yeah, in your in your studies, in your research that you would recommend for the class, for the folks. Man, that's such a great question. I um, oh, I've I've all the stuff I've read is a combination of so many different things, whether it's therapy, coaching, neuroscience. Um, so some of the ones that come off the top of my head that might be good for this group. Um, there's a book called Conversational Intelligence by Judith Glazier. Uh, she passed away a few years ago, but um, she talks a lot about communication and the neuroscience behind it, how to become more effective communicators. Um, because I think that's one thing I struggle with it a lot. It's like, how do you communicate your value? You know, there's value, but you just have trouble expressing it and getting it heard and getting it noticed. Um, that's great. Uh, in terms of um, self-regulation, um, honestly, for me, what helped a lot is actually parenting books, <laughs> right? Um, cause it's kind of like you're learning to parent yourself. It's just because we were never treated that way. We have trouble getting ourselves that way. So, um, there's a great book called the whole brain child by, um, Dr. Dan Siegel. He's a double, he's a, I believe he's a double board certified psychiatrist. He's a medical doctor. Uh, and he wrote a book called mindsight as well. That's not a parenting one, but that's a great one too, to learn a little bit more about the science. Dr. Gotcha. I am going to, I have to call an audible. 
I, yeah. I actually need to vacate the room I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> and so Jessica is going to take over for me. And uh, also, if there are anybody in the audience who has a question, please do go ahead and raise your hand and Jessica will help you out. Thank you, everybody. I'm so sorry for this distraction. and, and All good. But uh, thank you, Eugene, for, for the presentation. Folks, stay on. We've still got 10 minutes as well as the survey. I've got to hop off. So thanks. I'll talk with you later. Um, I was just going to bring up, and I just was typing it in the chat. Actually, I also have kids. Mine are a little bit older. And you, you said a funny thing that um, when you have young kids, you have to test your patience. I don't think that goes away. Yeah. I have a preteens <laughs> right now, so don't give up hope yet. <laughs> but um, And I also was told, because I also went through a time, and I'll tell everybody this because I'm, I'm very open about it now, but um, I went through a time with uh, mental health. Um, and actually it was pre-COVID and uh, I did express that I was constantly on fight or flight and that's what it was. I, I just was stressed for seven years because my kids were really young. I was working part-time, but it was like very demanding it was for say, so I've been for say since my kids were born. Um, and so uh, you can see the growth that we've had and mm. it was just too much. It was too much for me so we've expanded um our personnel for SACE and and we've that was a great decision but um I remember my doctor saying that when you have young kids it's like sitting in a crowded mall all day um and so that's why it made made sense as to why I was so tired at the end of the day because it really was um very draining to have that constant time and then I'm sure if you're at work too it's just you come home and there's no relaxation there either. Um, I'm going to go on to the next question because we yeah, did have a lot of questions and I'm not, let's see. I don't think we got to uh, the anonymous participant. It says, it sounds like changing your mindset towards self-compassion and holding yourself accountable consistently. Can you talk about your journey towards identifying and owning your emotions? Yeah. Um, I'll try to do it in a succinct way. Um, but the reason why this work means so much to me is actually the science stuff is just secondary. It's cool to learn the science behind all this. The primary reason why this means so much to me is I remember what it was like as a high school kid, as an Asian American who was still struggling a lot with his identity. I would be out late night on a um, Saturday night getting drunk with my high school friends, uh, sleep two hours, wake up Sunday morning, go to my local church that my mom would send me to and step on stage to lead worship for my church friends. Meaning I was in such a like people pleaser mode. Like I thought if I'm just who I think you want me to be, I will do that. Right. Even if it means saying yes, when I want to say no or no, when I want to say yes. Um, so it took me a long time to realize where, Hey, like there was this leader that once asked this question to this cliche question, right. Which was like, how do I find my perfect partner? Like as if there's a perfect partner out there, which by the way, usually is a survival state question. It's the brain going, Hey, I'm very unhappy. How do I find something outside of me uh, that I can hold responsible for my happiness so that if I'm ever unhappy, at least I have something to blame, right? Our brain focuses on the outside when it feels threatened. Imagine going to a dark forest and you hear a scary noise, you're going to pay attention to the outside. But the illusion is if we change things on the outside, it might feel better on the inside. It's usually not the case. So it took me a long time to realize I have to go inwards, right? So anyway, his answer was, would you go out with yourself? And I remember that hit me like a ton of bricks because my first answer was no. Right, reactive answer because there's lots of things to point out about yourself that you don't like. But then the second thing was, wait, hold on. I realized if I don't have a healthy relationship with myself, I can't have a healthy relationship with others. I can claim that I do all these nice things for my wife and say it's because I love them, but if I don't have a healthy relationship with myself, I'm actually not doing it for them. I'm doing it for me. This is where overgivers. This is when I realized, oh, that's a fight response. People overgive to the point of burnout. I was kind of touching on what you mentioned, Jessica, too. Like, there's these times where we feel like I just can't recharge. But then there's a subtle question to ask. It's just like, is there a part of me that's allowing my boundary to get crossed? To say no to myself when I really need this right now, right? In order to be a better support for the others around me, right? So it's it's very subtle, but it took me a long time to realize like, yeah, like if we don't have a healthy relationship with ourselves out of survival, transactionally, we will do these things for X, Y, Z, right? For other people for or try to accomplish more um, that I realized like, yeah, like that's a recipe for burnout. That's a recipe for, yeah, like just constant survival. And and it's not meant to be sustained long-term. It's very damaging 
um, both at a mental health standpoint and, and literally physically too, because of all the chemistry happening in your body when you're stressed. Does that answer the question? I feel like that. I think so. <laughs> Um, uh, and Sama Khan, I also noticed you're raising a hand. I see a question, um, in the chat here for, uh, can you discuss how to train to move out of chronic survival mode? So yes. now that we know there is that, how do you move out of that? That's where the long-term work comes in. Um, so there's, there's four phases of develop. It's a skill set to reprogram parts of yourself that aren't serving you, right. Where you literally can rewire your brain. Um, so the concept to understand is there's four phases. So the first phase of awareness around the skill that you're in is usually start off unconsciously unskilled, meaning you just don't know what you don't know. And at some point you're going to become consciously unskilled. Oh, now I know what I don't know, but I still don't know how to do this skill yet. And then you start practicing, practicing. This is where awareness comes in. This is where training comes in, right? And then you become consciously skilled at some point. Oh, I experienced the benefit. Oh, I identified my programming and I shifted it. I deconstructed some patterns of thinking that I realized weren't true. And I actually experienced the breakthrough. Um, once you're there, that's not what stops the chronic survival state. The chronic survival state takes work. It's a commitment like anything else, right? Um, through repetition. When you repeat something and practice getting good at something over and over again, you can usually end up doing it without thinking about it, right? You ever meet someone that's some, so good at something, you go, hey, how did you do that? And they're like, I don't know, I just did it. So that fourth phase through repetition, through practice, 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 right? Practicing awareness, practicing implementing some of these tools and resources on a daily basis eventually gets you to become unconsciously skilled. That's the fourth phase. And that's where we usually want to be if you're wanting to work on chronic, chronic stress, right? Chronic survival state where you're engaging in certain behaviors on autopilot all the time that you want to change. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, we have time, I think, for one more question. Um, and hopefully this question will leave um, more to discover from this topic. So it's you've already provided a great summary on the decision making. Um, thanks for organizing it. Uh, any recommendations on good books on this subject? So if on you decision have, making, yes. Yes. Um, I feel like I have one right and You can me. share those and yeah. Um, one great one is um, as tools and resources for like actual practical steps for uh, specifically for decision making. Once you're out of survival, um, there's a book called Decisive, I believe it was called. Uh, it's by Chip and Dan Heath for any Chip and Dan Heath fans. They wrote uh, Made to Stick. They wrote, um, what was the other really big one? <laughs> right. But there's um, Chip and Dan Heath. They wrote a book called Decisive. That's a great book for the decision making kind of skill sets. And if you share that over, I can add it. I'm going to send a follow-up email um, with the recording and yeah, yeah. Um, maybe your Absolutely. LinkedIn so people can get in contact with you. And then if you don't mind sharing that, I can put that in. And maybe if you have other resources, we can compile some Absolutely. of those for the yeah, attendees. Yeah, happy to send so. it over to you. Cool. Thank you. Um, I am going to go. I do want to save a little bit of time because I don't want people to drop off. Um, we want to make sure that we're um, hitting our, our audience and the things that they are wanting um, to hear from these webinar series. So I'm going to go over and do you see my screen? Okay, so I'm gonna put up a poll. Um, it has three questions, you'll have to scroll down. Um, if you could just take a minute to fill this out. And I'm going to explain a little bit about our next webinar. Uh, it'll be on July 2nd um, with Ajit Nat, uh, who is also on this call. I noticed, I don't know if he's still on, but I saw I um, we had admitted him. Um, and let me put in, so I just got the registration up for this. Um, let me send. If you're going to our website, you have to now add www at the beginning. Should just be this. So safeconnect.org backslash webinar, um, but use the www at the beginning, and then you'll be able to register for Ajit Nat, who will be on Tuesday, July 2nd. Um, additionally, um, for those of you that have not attended one of our webinar series before, or if this is your first involvement with SACE, you can also find us on the web. Um, again, use www at the beginning. Um, and we do have a um, Asian Women in Tech 
uh, event coming up on June 13th. So I know um, Dr. Eugene Choi was calling in from California, um, but this is, this is gonna be in the Bay Area. So if you do know people in the Bay Area, if you wanna go to our website, you'll see that we're hosting a June 13th in-person conference for Asian women in tech. So that is something that will be upcoming. And uh, just wanted, uh, thank you for joining and, and um, I'll be in touch with the follow-up. I'm gonna leave it run for just a couple minutes. So, oh, okay, I think the poll is good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.